Hello! Welcome to Why Not Both, the podcast all about how our multiple passions and interests shape our identity and our lives. My name is Pam Schaefer, and I am a musician and therapist in Los Angeles, and I also happen to be your host. This podcast is produced by Laura Studeris, and for this season, we've partnered up with Under the Radar magazine. If you like what you hear, you can hang out with us on social media. We are on Twitter and Instagram at WNB, the podcast. And if you really, really like what you hear, please support us on Patreon. We are under Why Not Both podcast. When you join our Patreon, you get a whole bunch of really cool behind the scenes stuff and you get to chat with us. And that's pretty awesome. Thank you so much for your support and I hope you enjoy our interviews. For this week's episode, we welcome the utterly magical Devendra Banhart to the show. I hope that you enjoy our interview. For the record, though, we should say that it was really interesting and like I just poured my heart out and, you know, said so many things that I could never, ever repeat that were incredibly insightful. And, yeah. um, and you forgot to press report. <laughs> They'll have to be reported in my memory and our ephemeral and therefore esoteric to everyone but us. Welcome to Why Not Both, where we're in the same city. So normally I'd be like, hey, let's do the interview in person. But during these circumstances, I'm like, hey, let's you know, go on the I, internet. I know. I mean, I, I it, it is a funny thing because I always thought like playing a show at home would be heaven. I'm just at home. The show's over and I can take a bath. It just It's like so nice. But that's not exactly the case. It was not so <laughs> here at home and you know, doing the interview over Zoom sounds so much more convenient in some ways it is, but so much is lost. You know, we don't get to actually just meet and sit and talk and you can so much more is communicated or so. Yeah, absolutely. By not just by what the person says by, but really the the tone and by how they say it and the just the energy and the whatever they're giving off. All of that is information that makes a journalist's, um, you know, kind of work uh, a little less of a caricature, which is most of what interviews are. It's this kind of, you know, you're not really getting the whole person. Plus, it's not, this isn't really, really me, because I'm aware that I'm talking to you over a computer. Right. There's always that little, that, you know, striving to be really yourself and to, be, to, to reach that intimacy, but it's quite difficult and it's definitely harder over zoom but i remember the last interview i did in person i um when i came home my house had been robbed <gasps> uh, they, uh, the the uh, a base oh wait noah noah's on the <gasps> phone He's calling noah. Me. hello hi we have noah well, so there's, you're not supposed to do a podcast with me right now? This is so meta. I love this. Okay. Well, then I'm doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <gasps> Mariah, but it, it, yeah, we're supposed to be talking about our record, right? Yeah. The podcast is Why Not Both? And hilariously, yeah, you, it's, it's the both of you. You are actually... It's supposed to be the both of us. That's so funny. Um, I mean, he's I welcome see. to join. I love talking to you, but he is more than more than welcome to join if he's free. Yeah, well, it's up to you, Noah. But I, I'm happy. I'm, it's about the record, so I don't know why you you're not you don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's for why not both podcast, which is taping right now. So right now on the podcast, I'm, t I'm talking to you about how you you're what the podcast is and how you this should be is on so that. good this is so good who's directing this right now i want to know who's directing this moment of our lives you know this is kind of just how it is normally for us so this why don't fantastic. you i'll send you the link and if you want to jump on um i think laura would be happy to talk to us both about the record that we both made <laughs> <laughs> or why not both yeah i mean it's the it's in the name of the podcast <laughs> Yeah. All right. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you and, and jump on if you can. I'm talking about having my uh, house robbed. So <laughs> I've got the bases covered as to why we made the record. All right. Bye. 
Um, spoiler alert, my producer is Laura. I'm Pam, and that is so on brand for the why not both, because at this point, she's actually a music journalist. I'm a musician and therapist, and people now mix us up, much like you were like, hey, wait, isn't it supposed to be me and Noah? Is it just me? (laughs) Is it just like in a way like Laura and I have become interchangeable and she's like, wait, everyone thinks I'm a therapist now. And I was like, everyone thinks I'm a music journalist now. (laughs) The intersection, let's explore the intersectionality between therapy and music journalism. I mean, I think that's quite interesting for sure. Right. And, you know, and and I think that one of, and, and, and certainly there's a, a branch of that certainly relates to why we made this record actually therapy and music journalism music journalism in terms of us trying to recreate a particular environment and time that was influenced not only by a particular architecture like you know the, 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 these kind of early health food stores the the mom and pop uh local health food store that we spent our our childhoods at but yeah. also some of the records that really shaped our um our, our childhood so that's the music journalist part where we're trying to reference some of those albums and then oh. the therapist part is like of course we we needed um an activity that was going to combat the the uncertainty and dread and 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 kind of horror yeah. that is still happening <laughs> I was going to say that that continues to spiral. Yeah, it gets it's really, really bad. I mean, it's we're definitely on on a what wave is this? What number wave is this? You know, it's kind of strange because people were talking about this as, you know, oh, well, the pandemic's over. And I kept saying this is a pandemic lull. And people were like, what do you mean? And I said, well, based on the data that's coming out, this appears to be a lull, but viruses mutate. That's what they do. And so this is kind of a lull for one. And then like, you know, then the next wave comes up unless you take these certain precautions that we know are good preventative measures. Um, And people are like, oh, well, that sounds very dry and boring. I'm going to go party now. And I'm like, cool. Okay. (laughs) Um, So it's a very funny thing, you know, in the West, we're so kind of uh, uh, spoiled so we just think like we're good we figured it out we've got the vaccine and so we don't know it's over you know like we yeah. decide that's the arrogant part like we decide like oh and on this day masks indoors as if the virus gives a shit as if right. it's like mm, you know what i'm gonna okay it's, oh i was gonna do it yesterday uh, yeah <laughs> yesterday but it's actually today okay i i <laughs> yes <laughs> Thank you for referencing the mask mandate in LA. I had the exact same reaction that I was like, oh, so Lady Corona's waiting until midnight on Saturday. How polite. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, and then there's still, you know, it's a weird thing. I mean, it's tough. It's tough. It's really tough. It creates a wedge between how I, my, my, I already was a very judgmental person, but now, you know, I see someone just not wearing it. I, wow, it's tough. It's really tough for somebody that has, isn't getting vaccinated. I it cha- it creates a little a, an immediate wedge, and and the yes. most I can do is go, okay, well, okay, just try to be neutral. Try to be neutral because if not, it gets pretty negative in my in my mind. Yeah, it's difficult when uh, it's interesting that especially you reference like the Western way of thinking of like we have solved it, kind of like man versus nature instead of like man as nature, um, and that yeah, like people. Funny people don't realize that like we are a collective and because we come from such like I mean America has such like a hyper individualist culture that it's like it's almost like you're watching part of your own body do something outside of your will and you're like wait no oh god <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you're like all of the parts have to work together to make this work <laughs> Like I have the same reaction when I see someone like, you know, like not masking or refusing to like, kind of like respect people's space and things like that. I'm like, you're harming others, but in a way you're just like harming yourself. Like someone compared it to like a zombie movie where like, you know, who the zombies are going to be. Like, there's not a lot of suspense. Mm. Um, and you're like, why, why would you do that? Why would you do that? <laughs> like, Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. It's a real tough one. It's a real tough one because 
you know, it, people have so much opportunity um, to be kind of educated in terms of what, like the, what is, what is this thing? What is this thing about? But fear is so powerful. And that individualism that is born from a kind of Western, um, you're right, not man, it's man versus nature, not man is nature or person is nature. So I totally, it, all that combines to make some strange, you know, because that's the thing, we're the, we're the stars of our movie though, you know, in this movie of our lives. Like, you know, we're, we're, we, we're, everyone's an extra to us. Right. So, and so the rules don't really apply to us and it's okay right. for everyone else, but not really for me. And that's like right. a general kind of the, uh, you know, delusional condition that we are, um, you know, nurtured to, to kind of believe, you know, the minute that we, we start to, you know, it's very natural to share little kids yes. it's, it's natural yeah. to share there's no you know and then once things start to develop into that possessiveness and your preciousness becomes so tied into your body and into your your your, your things that you own and your status and then suddenly you know that's it applies to everybody but you it's okay for everybody but you you know you can mm -hmm. you can through the cracks it's okay i don't really need to i can conceptually care about other people but really doing the thing not really for me i can slip through the cracks and what i what, what's mysterious is that you know what is actually in there and how this thing is developed and how it's made and i guess we're talking specifically about getting vaccinated like it's a really genius thing it's a brilliant thing and it's like you just, you know, it's you just look at the Wikipedia page on vaccinations. It's so interesting. You know, it comes from the root of cow, the word cow. From yes. The, the smallpox, which I think is so fascinating. That that alone. Okay, I get, get vaccinated just because, <laughs> you know, cows are great. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, yeah, like you were saying about like exploring the roots of things and even kind of like looking at the knowledge that we have figured out as humans and instead of being like oh i'm exceptional it's like oh i should really take part in the clever things that we have figured out absolutely we have that opportunity to actually you know look into where these things come from it's so interesting it's so interesting i mean you know science is so fascinating because in a weird way it's just a, it's obsessed with understanding it's obsessed with knowing it's obsessed with knowing and and i think even at a deeper level science is trying to kind of you know understand what is this you know trying it's trying to measure the metaphysical to some degree yes you know it's it's trying to know what the ultimate secrets of the universe i mean isn't that fascinating isn't that incredible and isn't that so deeply you know new agey and 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 mystical i mean there's this mysticality yes. um but all the information is there you know what i mean nobody is trying to 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 keep it from someone but it's not it's, it's just not appealing it's not exciting i think everyone wants to have the more kind of exotic and uh you know just because we're the star of our movie it's more interesting in the movie that you have the secret knowledge that it, it, no one else has you know? yes so that so that's just so it's kind of boring when like oh here's what it is it's good for you it's good for other people why do you like is wearing a mask how think about think about why that is such an affront to your identity why that is such a huge insult to you think about that a little bit and and, and why do you wear that mask so you don't get sick and so someone else doesn't get sick you're doing it for you you're doing it for other people the mask is a is not a metaphor. Mask as metaphor makes a lot of sense, and mask as actual thing is a is a real thing. It, it just works so well to just think of it. What is the point of it? What is the point of it? Um, anyway, so we made this record because we uh, were in. We knew we wanted to make this record. It was twenty years of wanting to make this record because we met over twenty years ago, and I think one of the first things we said was, "Let's make a an ambient record." <laughs> he was you know, I was going to Mills College and you know he'd grown up with Terry Riley and his son and Pauline Oliveros was one of his teachers and I was um, taking a sound class at the San Francisco Art Institute and was you know obsessed with John Cage and, and Morton Feldman and 
and and you know Harold Budd and Brian Eno, and obviously we loved Wyndham Hill, which, which our moms would play on the way to the co-op. <laughs> spent so much time in the co-op. So my mom, she looks at every product and she reads every word on the label. So it's, it was like really, I think it was I spent ninety percent of my childhood at the health food store and yes you know so <laughs> we were we that was such a deeply nostalgic thing for us and we both connected on that immediately um also in in terms of being the children of hippies you know to the children of yogis you know noah's parents have a, a a a teacher an indian teacher and i my parents have an indian teacher who's also one of my teachers where mm-hmm. i got my name devendra and so you know it wasn't it was it wasn't strange or exotic for us to grow up around ambient music and mm-hmm. um, pictures of, you know, the, 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 the teacher all over the house. And, yes. You know, so that wasn't strange or exotic, but, but it was, I, growing up, it wasn't like every friend we had, it was kind of like understood that. So when Noah and I met, it was that instant, um, you know, thing in common, that instant commonality. And then we were in Kyoto, at a temple called Honen Inn, mm-hmm. um, and there was an earthquake. Oh! And it was such an intense earthquake. I, I was under, and I was standing under a piece of glass, and I saw oh my it gosh. kind of like I saw it undulate, like it was liquid. Whoa! And of course, if it had broken, I think the shards would have um, just cut cut me in a billion bits. And the ultra presence of that moment the ultra be here nowness of mm-hmm. that and then we locked eyes at each other and we just knew okay this is this is it this is it and and this is it this is our last moment on earth and this moment we are so here we are so present and of course that's a big bummer because it's like you know you don't ultimately you don't want to have to jump out of an airplane to feel alive right but that moment was really profound and we were at that in this beautiful uh temple and at the temple we had a moment after the earthquake then we go to the temple and um we had a offering for the head um roshi for the for the priest mm-hmm. and um we, it was a big bottle of sake and 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 a couple couple bucks and we said thank you so much and we left because they'd let us record a, a song there that we never ended up using but that's when mm-hmm. you know in that environment we that's when we really realized we need to make the ambient record but the, uh, there was a moment as we were leaving they said no 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 please come back mm-hmm. um, the 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 head priest would like to meet with you and so we sat in this room and it just had three chairs and one little um scroll kanji mm-hmm. and and that's it and we sat in there for like 20 minutes but no one came. No one came in. <laughs> and then suddenly the head priest, the Kansu, walked in. He sat down. He didn't say anything. He just sat there. He's not saying anything. There's no one saying anything. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> okay. And then so I point at the scroll and I said, what does that say? What does that say? And he said, pure light. And then he just he walked. He walked away. He left. Wow. It was so cool. I thought that was like the most, what a wonderful hang. I, I, you know what I mean? I mean, what a wonderful hang. But of course, it's all contextual too. You go to a bar and somebody does that to you. It's like the most pretentious person you've ever met. But in that context, it was like, this is it. This is how it's Yes. <laughs> Just like Everything space. is about context. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was the impetus for like, okay, now it's time for us to um, really make this record. Obviously, yes. then the pandemic, and it was like this is, this is also how we're going to deal with this because this is a, this is an activity that required so much attention, so much focus, mm-hmm. and in the way that like Eric Satie would say um, that he was making furniture music, you know, <laughs> we were trying to make this kind of like get rid of the furniture music, you know, something to just kind of clear the space and create some sort of atmosphere that felt comforting, that felt like a refuge for us. Mm. And so Noah was writing these songs that had the, the there's a lot of Greek um, 
ti titles and words. And he is Greek. And also, I think mm -hmm. before the pandemic hit, he had some inspiration to go with his son and partner to Greece and finally, you know, show him his son where, where you know, where his ancestors come from, etc. And so I think he had that longing to travel there. And mm -hmm. so a lot of those songs have this um, Grecian theme in the title. And some mm -hmm. of them, the titles changed, but that was the initial, how initially when he shared his his demos from the record and I had I had a, my suitcase packed to go on a pilgrimage to beer in India mm -hmm. and to Bhutan and so my songs have that kind of longing to get to get to go on that pilgrimage mm -hmm. and, um, so is this kind of our, our weird way of almost trying to travel through composing these pieces and it was the right record to make because we could make it remotely. You know, it'd be much, I think, harder to, maybe it'd be much easier if I just written, oh, okay, here's some, some pop songs, you know, here's some songs of mine. I don't know if they're pop or whatever they are. Um, but this was the right type of record, I think, to do remotely where we could compose the de the demos and, and really, it's really half Noah's songs, half my songs. Mm -hmm. And you could tell because his are the good ones. <laughs> You know, they're really beautiful and well composed. And mine are just kind of like these little, they're just little like, well, I'd like to think of them as angel farts. <laughs> There's your pull quote right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful hearing you speak of both the physical pilgrimages that you and Noah were taking or wanted to take but also in a way of like the sonic pilgrimage that you made back to your roots in health food stores and back to the roots of the sounds that you heard when you were young that I was just like, oh, you went to this place of comfort with this record during this time. And even you had said like that people want secret knowledge. Like that is what makes us feel special is like the main character essentially. And in a way, like, I feel like health food stores, like I grew up, I don't know if you've been to follow your heart in LA. Um, yeah, like, of course. Yep. That is when I became a vegetarian when I was a teenager. That was, of course, like, that was my spot. Um, <laughs> like, and course, no one else's is yours. <laughs> mine. It's all mine. And my friend who started working there as a cashier when we were in like ninth grade, because of course, like all the cashiers, there are teenagers in the valley. Um, but I remember like browsing through the books there and like, you know, I just, I loved being there. I still actually like, it's like one of my comfort spots to go to but the way that things were framed were almost as like this secret that you had stumbled upon when really it was just like not common knowledge but like relatively um simple to understand easy to grasp kind of things mm. um however it's within the trappings of that now you're part of this secret club you're part of the club of people who go to places like follow your heart so you know this yeah, I mean, that's just copy and uh, advertisement, you know, people, you gotta, it doesn't mean that the product itself, like you said, it's very simple stuff. Some of it is very, very, um, and it's obviously universal and it's obviously rooted in some of the, the, you know, most ancient kind of manifestations of wisdom that humanity has to offer that's still mm -hmm. around. So it's mm -hmm. so absurd that this would be like, here's some secret knowledge that only now we know about. But but at this, but, so what I'm saying is that the product itself is, is wonderful, most likely, let's say, mm -hmm. but how it gets clothed, um, they're just, you know, people have to make a buck, I guess. But it is that thing of like, okay, here's the secret knowledge only we know. But it's so yeah, funny. and you have to, I think you have to get people somehow. Like that's the thing is some people might seek this stuff out because they're curious. Whereas some people might need almost that extra, like that extra glitter in there. That's just like, hey, here's this shiny thing. And people are like, hmm, a shiny thing? Like it kind of magpie over. <laughs> like... yeah, I, like that. I need a shiny thing. I love a shiny thing, of course. Because, you know, the, it's almost like, it's a, I, like, I need the shiny thing. And then I realize, oh, this is kind of like requires some work. Like all this stuff, like being, being healthy, either mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, it's really kind of... It, 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 it requires work. It requires your participation. And that's kind of a drag. It's not so fun. 
you know so once you so you need that shiny thing to go oh yeah i gotta get that thing i want that and then you go oh shit this requires <laughs> my part but, and then beyond that though the true sparkly shiny thing happens yes it's a, it's a collaboration and it's like i remember one day years ago i had um, looking at my books in the library and i had a cookbook next to a book on buddhism mm -hmm. and I, it just kept staring at these two books you know one's this cookbook and like whatever the recipes for blah 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 and the other one was you know a history of buddhism a compilation of buddhism buddhism through the ages or whatever i'm just looking at these two books and it's like oh wow you know the cookbook doesn't actually have any food in it <laughs> <laughs> you know? and this book on buddhism has a lot of information yeah but it, it doesn't actually have buddhism in it it doesn't have enlightenment mm -hmm. in it <laughs> yeah you know it's like the book it's like uh, i could have a i could be just dehydrated i could be so thirsty and a book and a photo of a glass of water isn't really going to help me right it might but it is going to give me an idea of what that thing that is going to help me, what does it look like? Right, right. You know? And thinking of those early health food stores, that's the part of California that I love. You know, oh. this is where the first health food stores in on the West um, first emerged and, and came into being. And they were community centers. Mm -hmm. And what i mean think of like the whole earth catalog and that world that was all happening that was the scene i mean i still marvel that the fucking ravi shankar playing at the monterey pop festival a four hour guitar set for the kids who at that time were the hippest they were the youth of america these are the youngest hippest people and they're sitting there watching Ravi Shankar for four hours. Can you imagine that happening today? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the, fi the fire fests featuring, you know. Featuring the slice of cheese. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Uh, oh God, that would be amazing. What a different time. Well, and you speak to attention in a way that is fractured is i think the word that came to mind <laughs> like when you said like sitting for four hours observing that and even sometimes the art of ambient music like that in a way you do attend to ambient music when you're listening to it but also you can in some ways like not attend to it like for instance during a four-hour concert i would imagine like i don't think i would be fully present for all four of those hours i might be physically present but like my mind would probably go many places. I might even get up and stretch, like, you know. <laughs> that's, I, I, that's a really sweet like, kind of threat. I, I, you know, I mean, I may even stretch. <laughs> oh, whoa. <laughs> this microaggression will not stand. I will say, you know, microaggression is interesting, but what about micro kindness, huh? Today I'm gonna oh. be a little bit less of a dick. <laughs> You know, I, just micro kindness. Just micro kindness. I listened to um there's a woman that I really like that I just met in person and all of my meeting in person people skills have just dwindled even further from where they were prior to this. Like I'm deeply introverted and so me meeting new people is me just kind of standing there going, "Oh wow." <laughs> and waiting for them to say something. Um, <laughs> but I met um, Amanda uh, Amanda Yates Garcia, and I listened to her readings every week. And her reading for this week, the line that stood out to me was to heal by committing acts of generosity. Ooh, yes. Yes. And that's that beautiful. I mean, that's kind of, yeah, that's like compassionate revenge you know compassionate revenge oh that's so good Just yeah to, I mean I remember seeing um uh, Richie Havens before he died and he looked at the audience and he said I love you and there's nothing you can do about that I just <gasps> love you and it was like a gr it was violent there's nothing you can do about it but I, and I love you. And it was like, whoa, 
this oh. paradoxical, beautiful, powerful, like aggressive love, compa- you know, revengeful compassion. It was like, anyways, that line reminded me of that's beautiful. Oh, that's amazing. That's, there was a, so I, I see her readings every week on, on Instagram and I have been, um, I was house sitting for a friend and whenever I'm house sitting, I just, I read people's books, um, like one does. And I was reading a book on astrology because that was the one that jumped out at me simply because there were holograms on the side of it. Shiny. Uh, <laughs> you know, shiny. And I, huh? yeah, right. I was literally like, you have successfully lured me in with this holographic text on what is that what is the book cover called there's a name for it on a hardcover book the little floppy bit that goes on it but whatever good floppy bit yes thank you i like floppy (laughs) bit. let's go with shiny floppy bit by the way is my what my name actually means (laughs) the shiny floppy bit (laughs) now when people ask what your name means in an interview Okay, so you you're reading. So, this book on I was reading. I was reading this book on astrology, and there's a whole thing about like how to read your chart. So of course, I like figured out my chart, um, and it was about like where different planet placements are. And apparently, my Mars, which is how you tend to deal with conflict or be out in the world, really, how you interface mm-hmm. with people, and how you might like fight for things, essentially. Uh, is in Libra, which is literally the sign of getting along with people, and in the seventh house, which is about collaboration. So quite literally, my chart was like, you fight people by getting along with them really well. <laughs> Whoa, that's incredible. That's that's incredible. And do you think, is that true? Is that how you you, you approach yeah, your I, interactions and, and your conflicts? I realized that that really, that did resonate in that um, it has been said to me many times that it's nearly impossible to argue with me. And it's really difficult to be upset with me because if someone's upset, I'm like, oh no, someone I care about is upset. And I mean, I obviously I care about people in varying degrees. It goes anywhere from like neutral to like, here's someone I don't really know, but I have compassion that they're upset to like someone that like I deeply love that I'm like, oh my goodness, like one of my beloved people is upset. But I default to like recognizing the upset first. Like I don't defend myself first. I address like that someone seems to be hurt or or bothered. Um, and then we try and figure out like what happened. I mean, that's skillful. That is really, I'm really, I'm just so happy for you because that's incredibly good karma. I mean, that's really amazing to have that. Um, unless it can maybe go the opposite way where it serves against, it, it starts to work against you, where you're like, wait a minute, actually, no, I need to, you know, maybe it could, uh, there's an opposite side to that where it's like, oh, I need to set some boundaries here because I'm just like, yeah. apologizing for something I had nothing to do with, et cetera, right? Right. It could be that extreme version of it. But generally that feeling of, wait a minute, I know I'm not giving anyone fuel, you know, if you're trying to argue with me, I'm just trying to, uh, to put out the fire here. And I feel so bad that you're hurting. So this is such such an incredible karma. I'd already just naturally have that tendency. So you're really lucky. I mean, that's really skillful. It's really skillful. Uh, yeah, I Thank wish you. I could relate. <laughs> I, I I only I. <laughs> um, no, but you know, uh, uh, my way of solving a conflict is just saying let's hang out so let me know when you're not home so i can come so i can come over then and look at your books <laughs> yeah, it's like a really good <laughs> hang for me you know, I just want to go over to your house and no, no no one's there and just check out your books because i know you put a lot of work into your books and and these books are kind of a glimpse into what's interesting to you and what you care about and what you you're interested in and so I'm going to check that out and, and we can have a conversation through that. No, that's not <laughs> a bad idea. That is actually like, cause that does give you compassion for others when you can understand them better. Because oftentimes if we're in conflict, it's because either someone has misunderstood something, there's missing information. There was like a misinterpretation somewhere mm-hmm. like, and so if you can then, because if the person's not present, then it's not going to be emotionally activating. If you can go through the metaphorical bookshelf. Ooh, that's even the metaphorical bookshelf. That's really interesting too, right? So just kind of imagine 
what this person that is misinterpreting what you the what the real uh, intention behind whatever is the, causing the conflict, you know what this person uh, imagine each one of those things that they're kind of accusing you of or misinterpreting. Imagine each one of those as a type of book. What kind of book mm -hmm. is it? So you're just, you're creating the metaphorical um, book, uh, the metaphorical uh, library, and and then you can look at that library and what kind of books are there, uh, and then kind of have a new sense of compassion for the person because it's also always so nuanced when you're fighting with somebody you know that person never thinks i'm misinterpreting them <laughs> you know the person <laughs> fighting with never thinks i am misinterpreting you you asshole you know what i mean I mean, no one thinks they're the bad guy nobody thinks that they are the one that is misinterpreting nobody you know what yes. I mean? and it, it's always a misinterpretation and it's, right. always, and it's always both parties, you know, it's always both parties. Because we're the main character. It's hard to like actually frame yourself as the villain. Like there have been situations in which goes, I'm the villain. No way. Yeah. Like I've had, I mean, as, as copacetic as most of my relationships are, even I have a hard time, you know, and I have to pause and be like, what am I missing? Like if this person's upset, maybe I did miss something. <laughs> like, yeah. When I, but... the villain doesn't know they're the villain, I mean to say that there is no villain. It's and also nobody is one thing. Everybody is just how, what they are at that moment. So we always have to give a little bit of space for this person to be a new person given the, the next moment. So you say, oh, I saw this person. Oh, they're like this, like this. They're actually not like that. If that was if that was one minute ago, they might be they might be a different person. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe they're worse of whatever those attributes that you find so, you know, uh, repulsive. Right. But there it's different it's different or at least always keep that little bit of space for that for that that change which is really more realistic as to how, what, what's going on with that person well i do try i think it's important that you said to give people space to change like when you were talking about before like the information is all here of how we can actually help each other through wave you know 70 billion of this pandemic where it's like giving people the chance to change their minds, giving people the chance to take in new information. Um, like That is really helpful. That is really helpful. You know, Long Chempa has this amazing quote, which is we label things as how they appear to us. So think about how you label things, that you're labeling them based on how they appear to you. So maybe there are certain things that you are labeling as really dis dis disgusting or disdainful or really or evil. Okay, they are appearing that way because you're labeling that way. Consider relabeling them and perhaps you'll be free from having this discomfort and finding this thing so uh, awful. So you, there's some kind of power that can be, um, there's so much power in, in perception. Yes, yes. And in kind of like the stories that we tell ourselves, like I love the idea of going through and like reading, reading the books of someone's stories essentially like what stories is this person telling themselves i wish i knew like occasionally i'll ask people like especially if i feel like i've had a miscommunication with someone or like if i want clarity i'm like oh well what story are you telling yourself and i totally totally got that from Brene brown like i think that that's a brilliant intervention that she came up with um because we all are telling ourselves our little main character narratives in our heads. <laughs> That's exactly what I mean, yeah. And I mean, I think they're really brilliant, by the way. Uh, but I, um, I, I it's a, that story. And so, so you can change the story. That's, that's where it becomes empowering, is like, you can change that, that story because it, you're telling yourself the story, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that brings us all the way back to health food stores in the yep. <laughs> exactly by the way the detail that i loved in the story of your record was that um both of you had the recollection of the smell of freshly milled peanut butter mm. it said and i i know that smell like so intimately from my experience of both health food stores and the farmer's market in la that i was just like i love that we're all united by that olfactory memory <laughs> <laughs> that maybe that was somehow that fresh that, or it's i don't know if it's that well it is fresh but also there's yeah it's like dusty fresh yes! so if if we can't manage to convey that sonically somehow i think we did a good job and i'm so happy that you know what we mean and and i think as a little kid 
that's it's also not so surprising because it's an interesting pleasant smell but also the machine is so cool <gasps> the machine like, whoa, the what's this cool thing? like whoa it doesn't come in a jar like you see it you know it's big funnel and it like crunches it in it's like wow. yes and it has that big the metal twirly bit in it mm. that like that's where because i would i would sometimes wander off like at the farmer's market because things were interesting um and i was small and well this this actually is very accurate to who i am as a person still but um so my parents would just plant me in front of like the peanut butter stall because I would watch the peanut butter churn. I found it fascinating. So if they didn't want me to go anywhere, they'd be like, going, here you are. <laughs> I wonder if that's like, it, it, there, there is a fascination to seeing things like made. And to this day, one of the things that when I can't sleep, I'll watch is the show How It's Made. Mm. Uh, which is like 24 seasons of it and it's just a different there's like each episode is three or four different products being made assembly line mm -hmm. style, mm -hmm. or not. you know just however it's just so these all these kinds of things from doorknobs to tires to you know peanut butter and and it's like oh something about that is so calming you know it just it fully would. lulls me to sleep so i don't know maybe that stems from those early days of just being propped in front of the peanut butter <laughs> just being interested in that versus you know, everything else was not that interesting although it was cool to see some of those early health food store images of like there'd be a tree smiling or a wizard on some of these products you know what i mean like nope. nugget was a really cool little bee smiling so you know as i was as a little kid you're looking for like fun little hippie cartoon stuff a little magic and everything but mostly it's a lot of mung beans and that's not the most exciting <laughs> thing when you're, you know, five years old. Ah, uh, yes. The, the bulk section of the health food stores was always like such a mystifying thing to me because I was always afraid that like if I was putting stuff in a bag, I'd like pour too much. And then like with the scoop thing, like they were always so big for my hands. And so like I was always a little intimidated by it. I mean, I still am. I still am. <laughs> <laughs> It's an incredible thing. I actually recently saw photos of the, the seed bank at, at the World Fair in, in Shanghai, I think, a couple of years ago. And it was like the most incredible, incredible structure. And inside there's seeds from the, from the whole world and from almost every species. of. of wow. and, as, and that's how the feeling of like as a little kid, you see the bulk bin like, oh, here's like, is this al alchemy? Are these the elements of the universe? Do I, yes. can, can I combine this and make like a black hole or like, <laughs> like you know these what are these extremely exotic mysterious yet very boring looking things you know <laughs> yes a sense of what life is all about and <gasps> half bin section of a <laughs> oh my gosh and when you when you're talking about the assembly of things it suddenly clicked in my mind that when you were talking also about the artists that inspired you, like I was thinking of listening to like John Cage or even like Steve Reich popped in my brain of just like, when you're watching the assembly of something, it's a slow evolution to something that you then recognize at the end mm. and ambient music and sometimes progressive music like that can happen in the same way where it's like, you start off with like a little sonic loop, but then it like, it actually builds itself in a way that by the end, you end up with something that actually is more sonically textured, maybe like, what one would think of as like a traditional song or things like that in Western culture, but you're there for the progression of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also I sometimes think like if I had spent, um, if I had spent 20 years drawing a dot and I drew that and I spent 20 years and then I go in front of you and I draw that dot and then we take somebody else or maybe I don't do it in front of you. I draw that dot. It's like 20 years. I drew that dot. And then we have somebody who's never drawn a dot and they draw that dot. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the difference? Would you be able to tell the difference? And in context of what you just said, I think some of these pieces begin just filled, all the, all the space is filled. And, and, and as opposed to this piece that, because there are many pieces, like you just said, that begin with a, a, a gentle, simple theme and they build and they build up and you see the creation of it. You see the, the elements come together to make mm -hmm. the whole. Some of these pieces, though, I think begin fully realized and fully full and overcrowded. And then it's a process of elimination, of extraction, mm -hmm. extraction, extraction. And you're left with something that maintains a very, very simple uh, skeletal kind of shape. 
and and it just it doesn't build it just keeps that skeletal shape but it's been it's been harvested and 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 distilled from something much greater and i think that can be felt meaning if you saw that drawing that dot that somebody spent 20 years doing next to the dot that no that the person who's never drawn a dot does i, I think i think i'd like to believe that you could tell which mm. one ha is infused with 20 years of intention infused mm -hmm. with 20 years of, of working on getting that dot down i think you would be able to recognize it it'd be a fun experiment to do maybe i'm wrong but but i think so uh, or you might think that the one well yeah no it's another i'm getting into something else but ah! basically just, if you've never played piano before, it, you sound like the best piano player in the world. Of course. You sound like avant-garde master. <laughs> You're like, is that a cat or is it Schoenberg? We're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you for being on board with my extremely nerdy humor. <laughs> oh, no, it's brilliant. It's <laughs> Um, when you're talking about your collaborator and his connections to his ancestry in Greece, what you're saying almost reminding me of when you're actually carving a sculpture out of marble that you're chipping away at something to get something inside of it as opposed to building outward. Absolutely. Anyways, it works both of those ways. So I'm, <laughs> I, I definitely, I was agreeing with you, but also saying it works that other way. And yes. yeah, that's exactly it. You start with more than you need and then you narrow it down you know you, you 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 streamline it you refine it refining is really important you know how do we refine you know how do we refine refining is nice yes bringing things uh, down bringing things down and i don't know if you work this way but whenever i'm producing something i do tend to go maximalist like when i'm in the midst of making it and then like in the you know you edit and then you mix and then like as i'm going through i, I pull stuff out I do the exact same thing. I do the same thing. It's like I it's like accumulation, 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 and now let's just just chop it all down till we can till we can really essentialize something. You know, so yeah. so that's the challenge in a, in a way like okay, here's a notebook filled with words. How do I reduce this notebook to a sentence? Mm. That's like kind of one of the that's part at least that's my process. It sounds like it's yours too. Yeah, and especially, I've only made a bit of ambient music. Like, even my ambient music, sometimes I'm like, oh, this has a lot going on. <laughs> Would you share that with me? Would you send me? Would you share it with me? Yeah, I'd be happy to share it with you. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was just like, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> Thank you for inquiring. I love that your reaction to the isolation of the pandemic was actually similar to mine because that is when I found myself making more ambient music because I found it almost overstimulating to try to sing or make, I don't know, like formal song structure in a way was just like, oh, no, this is too much. I just need to make like a sonic texture that makes me feel a little better. Yeah, I could so relate to that. It was That was my experience as well. At first I was like, oh, let's write some songs and and I just what I did have that feeling some of okay let's write let's what else can I do I'm gonna get into the studio and write and I looked at all the songs and they were so they were such kind of obvious reflections of what I was feeling yeah like they were I looked at these songs and they were just me repeating over and over again either don't touch me don't touch mm. me or what will it be like when I go outside into this other world, or I saw you pleading with the cops, pleading with the cops. I just kept repeating these like things that were just, I was just watching in the world. And that seemed like premature to be writing about it. Somehow when you write a song, it, it, I think the most successful song, you don't actually know what it's about till six months later or a year later. Oh, that's what that was. Really? Yeah. When, when it was so clearly like, this is exactly about what's happening now. It it, it 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 something was it felt r r just premature you know and that feeling for some uh, composing in a different way started to emerge and it, it was of course at first super kind of my snobby arrogant oh i just like i'm just going to hold down an 
a key and put a lot of reverb on it and then <laughs> like so easy <laughs> out, for me at least it was required so much attention and so much energy and so much <laughs> discipline to actually compose something that is so delicate and and ha doesn't have any words and it isn't about m the thing that i really do which is make some music that'll serve as a platform for words that's the thing i'm interested in is the words suddenly it's like how do you make something that is slow and evolving yes and, and takes its time and and has space and and, that, and all of that requires a lot of attention a lot of of discipline and I'd be sometimes falling asleep, like falling asleep, trying to, mm -hmm. trying, you know, requires this kind of focus that just writing a, a, a verse chorus song it, it doesn't have. That, that's kind of this dynamic, exciting, like, blah, kind of thing compared to this other thing that is much, that requires a lot more energy. I didn't realize that. Yeah. It requires a sense of presence. That? What was that like for you? Yeah, it was, I had a similar experience with it. And what you're speaking to also speaks to a friend of mine who I became friends with him actually because of the podcast, like right before lockdown, it was in January that I interviewed um, Rob, um, his name is Rob Graves, and he usually does production work, but had just started making ambient piano music um, and is a writer. And now it's so fascinating because he will record himself playing the piano like on every Saturday morning he'll just kind of noodle on the piano but the way that he does that is that he'll like just really pull out like a meditative kind of idea and then he takes those and will kind of expand upon them a bit sonically but for the most part he just tries to preserve that quality of that like that meditation and it's almost the restraint in his production work around it and in his intention that's fascinating to me because I found that very difficult but also very rewarding because I kept wanting to add extra sounds I kept wanting it to go more places I kept like my tendency was to like want to take it somewhere else and it's like that practice of restraint was actually I mean it was calming but it was challenging and I really enjoyed it <laughs> totally totally and, and what kind of songs do you normally compose um it really ranges like if I'm writing for myself, like I'll sometimes even just write like piano and voice songs that literally I just want to sing like I don't even care about sharing them with someone else like I just want to play them because they're fun. Um, but often if I'm expanding something outward like I do one of my friends called me a space witch and it stuck. <laughs> I I'm imagining yeah this amazing witch in space, but then also like a sandwich made of the cosmos. <laughs> Um, and those are the things I can relate to that very much. I, I, I mean, I compose mostly with the guitar, but that's me leading the song. You know, I'm leading the song. And then with with ambient, it's really about that, like you said, that restraint where you, the song is leading you. You know, you, you, you're, you're letting the song lead and you're just seeing where it can take you. So, you, so the, and things get murky and things get inauthentic and fishy when you start to try to lead the song. Mm. You know, when you sit at the piano and you just let it lead you, and if you do that in a respectful way, a conscious way, the li you we can tell the listener can tell we can tell that you know. Yes. That's how you you know that it's really interesting. It's really interesting. It's a subtle thing, and it's also a very obvious, blatant kind of thing. Like, oh my God, this person is trying to lead the song. Forget it. They're trying to do a, it's a show. They're trying to pretend like this is, they're just doing some, it's a facsimile. Or I see this person is following, the, the, this person is kind of dancing with this moment here. Ooh, this person yes. is, is, kind of, is kind of getting out of the way, you know? Ooh, okay, I, can, I, I see that. I can relate to that. That's touching the part of me that I that is the most intimate part of me, which is the part that I can discover when I get out of my way. Mm. When I disappear. That's you know, a beautiful way of putting it. God, that's when I'm present. That's when I'm free. When I disappear, when I get over the trip, when I get over myself. Mm-hmm. 
And in a way, I don't know about you, but for me, that's almost easier to do with someone else. Like I almost have to like, like I just started a project by sheer accident. Um, that's the way I do most things now that I think about it. Um, <laughs> it's like, so many of my stories are like, so then this thing happened. Was it intentional? Not consciously. Um, but I sent a voice note um, of me just playing the piano to a person who is becoming very dear to me. And he took it and I don't know how to describe it other than he took that unfiltered moment and then he ran it through his own unfilters. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah. And the the sonic result is this really, cause it's like, I took kind of one of those like unconscious moments of just letting the piano lead me. And then he let that piano lead him mm -hmm. through his own sonic process. Um, and it's hard because once you create something like that, you want to create that again, but the only way to create that again is to not be conscious of creating it again. Oh, totally. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's like, Hey, fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling myself to fall asleep. I can't fall asleep. Exactly. Why we long for these. I mean, that's why, you know, that's, I mean, that's kind of why some kind of contemplative practice or let's say meditative practice is really, really helpful because it is bringing you back to that place and, it, and and you know for many people that have maybe nothing like that that's why things like getting high or, or having an orgasm are so they're obviously feel wonderful but even further behind that is this desire to get out of the way it's yes this desire for that kind of ego annihilation and the freedom that comes from that of like oh yes. the trip of me because i'm not because in the because particularly in orgasm let's say like you're really most of the time not being not thinking oh what do i have to do later you know you're just really there <laughs> yeah, exactly. i want to enjoy this thing but that can also obviously you know that's sometimes what's behind us wanting to make music and especially play live music with other musicians Yes. You know, those are these moments of, of um, forgetting oneself and of being really present. Um, I, I'd love to hear that, too. There's so much of your music that I get to hear now. Thanks. Please send all Aww, of Oh, <laughs> you're so sweet. And, like, I realized I was, like, thinking about even, like, the crossover of, like, oh, Greek artist, you actually covered one of my friends, um, Iona. No. Yes. No, I love her. I mean, she's truly one of my, my favorite people in the world. I love her. She is so sweet. Song. Oh, my God. Like, and she and I, it's so funny. Like, she and I met through the podcast as well. If you had told me a year and a half ago, hey, so you're going to start this podcast on a lark. And then the first music journalist who ever wrote about you, who became good friends with you, is going to hop in as a producer because she thought that for, quote, a few weeks, she wouldn't be able to travel. Wow. And then you would produce over 80 episodes of this podcast and make some of the most amazing friends from the comfort of your living room. I'd be like, this story makes no sense. This wow. plot line is ridiculous. <laughs> like, I know, right? That's psychic. You would have fired that. You would have walked right out of that. Out of that, that I'd have been like, I don't care how shiny the flappy bit on your book is. This makes no sense. <laughs> like, shiny flapper. Um, that's incredible. I was going to ask you what was the kind of impetus and the or the genesis for this podcast. So it was it was that, huh? It was a yeah. Theater. It was, it was simply, it was last year at one point, um, I realized that I was spending more time in both of the worlds that I'm usually in. Like I was, I had started composing for friends, art installations, and I was releasing my own music that like, I had just really stepped into the role of producer, which was very new for me to actually own that. Um, and so I was like, wow, I'm doing that. But I'd also opened my own private practice, but it had gone so well that I mean, now, especially based on last year, I have six people on my team now, which is crazy. It went from me. And then I was like, oh, I should hire an associate to train. I want to, I want to help like baby therapist. Um, and now it's like this whole team. And so I increasingly was just present in both of those worlds, but felt almost very split where it's like, I felt kind of like the elder millennial Hannah Montana. <laughs> <Where> like, 
<laughs> where I'm like, you know, these worlds really aren't so different in a way. Like both of these are about creating the reality that we want to live in and helping people. Mm. Um, and I was like, I wonder if I could talk to other people who are doing multiple things or who are in multiple spheres and how that like impacts their sense of identity and what they choose to do in the world. And that was kind of the conceit of it in the before times. And then it was like, I started this right prior to when like basically identity and perception of others broke. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a really fascinating journey of, <laughs> of that, that I was like, oh, I thought I was just going to be interviewing kind of these outlier people about their, you know, their things. But now everybody in a way has been fractured in the spheres that they're in. And so oh, this expanded in ways I didn't anticipate. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, really, it's like so valuable, really, because you have you have this record of this of this moment, you know, that that is that is really so intense, so heavy and and is still happening. And I don't know why I shouldn't be talking to anyone because I'm so sad. I'm so fucking sad that I'm, sh I'm surprised that anything is even coming out of my mouth. No. But we're talking about that. Yeah. I'm talking about how it's really difficult to talk and how much yeah. I don't want to talk and how much it's, it's like so hard to not just weep. There's, the, I, there's constantly just the tears are right about to come out behind my eyes. Really, really, for, really. Mm. And, and, and I don't want to be talking, but here we are talking about that and you've got a record of that. And that's, and that's, and not, maybe not with me, but with all the other people you've spoken with, that's, that's, that's important. That's significant. That'll, that'll be of value, especially with Ioana. You know, she's so brilliant. She's really a brilliant interdisciplinary artist, like amazing poet, a really amazing poet, you know, and um, so talented. My God, footage of her at the, uh, a couple oh, yeah. Of going off in the show it's like this give me a break only only she could do that you know and i'm just like getting nervous well, I, mean, I could go to the the supermarket I'm like, whoa i gotta go this is intense <laughs> how did she do that i don't know it's really wow it's a different i think her sorcery is beautiful to witness and i'm yes, yes. The fact that you even said like that you were just like, you know, you have this record of other people and that you want to weep. And like, I mean, I cried in meditation yesterday. Like I was meditating and like I had felt like there had been this like shard kind of stuck in me all day, but I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And then like I just cried while I was meditating and I was like, OK, this is where we're at. All right. Well, maybe maybe that shard will loosen. And it did mm -hmm. um, that. It's OK to like it's okay to be on the verge of tears. It's okay to speak through that sadness. It's okay sometimes to feel so sad that you can't speak. Like, I think that that is valuable. For that is, that is what you just said really is. It's okay to feel that. So it's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. I, I, t I say, you know, we talk about it. Oh, I cry all the time. But when you're doing it like on a live Zoom meeting, which just happened to me the other day. Yeah. It's like pretty humiliating, right? At that moment, you're just like, because you're so, this is so embarrassing. Nobody wants this heavy trip. What are you doing? But then, no, it's okay. It's just, it's just, it just happens. It's okay. Yeah. And then sometimes someone will say like, well, it was nice to see that I feel that way all the time too. Or, or I feel that way sometimes. And it was just nice to see another person, you know, express that yeah and so i'm just in a way less eloquent way reiterating what you just said <laughs> it's really okay to feel about to weep or to weep and the older i get the more i weep over uh, things that aren't sad yes and that's not necessarily a bad thing and tears have their own you know they, they can be you can there are tears of joy too there are tears of joy there are tears of of of, of love mm -hmm. there are tears of sorrow and you know it's like the, all those you know kind of expressions can be really cleansing and can be really really important and 
and it's just how it is right now. I mean, I made this record with the dream of playing it for my one of my heroes, Harold Budd, but he, he died of COVID. Wow. I would just want, I was like, I'm making this record. Okay, we wanted to make it for 20 years, and we were in the earthquake in Kyoto, and at that moment, we had the experience with the priest, and we just know this is the time. Oh, and the pandemic, okay. Behind that even was this, I cannot wait to share this the, with one person, which is Harold Budd. You know, he was, he was, I didn't, I met Harold and we were friends, but um, he, I was more of this just in reverence. I couldn't even talk when I was around him. I, yeah. I, I listened to his music more than any other person probably in the world. And, and I never got a chance to give him the record, you know, mm. and I know that, oh, geez, even at the beginning, my friend Hal Wilner was one of the, you know, he died really quickly of COVID. Mm. And there still hasn't been, a kind of getting together to to mourn that and to honor him and celebrate him together because it's still going mm -hmm. and part of that fracture you know that's just an example of that fractured you know reality that we're in well and like it's interesting because I have such a human instinct to want to say that like it's okay somehow or that he knows that you made that record but it's also in a way like there's nothing I can say that makes that situation better like that just is the situation that just is the situation yeah which is which is yeah that just is a situation <laughs> yes which is us not adding any story to it yeah which is okay which is just sitting with it a lot of it is sitting with it you sit with something long enough, okay, it's a little less scary, it's a little more understanding, it's a little clearer, you know? And the longer you don't sit with something, the more confusing and obscure it becomes. Exactly, exactly. Like, sometimes there even are, like, those inarticulate shards. Like, that's how I felt yesterday, where I didn't even know what it was. Like, I was trying to pinpoint what it was that was actually bothering me. And I still don't know. Did I cry about it? Oh, yeah. But could I articulate it? No. Like, I, I still don't know exactly what it was that was dislodged. But mm, Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I also will say um, that we officially now uh, have to start a band. You, me, Ioana. We are called Inarticulate Shards. And yeah. we're playing at the Acropolis again. So. Oh my God. I just, you can't see me. I just got so excited. You can probably hear it. <laughs> the Acropolis. The and, inarticulate shards, yes. which is so funny because you and I want are both just wildly articulate. And so I was like, that's just, I love that so much. And right now we're all fractured around the same city together. In articulate shards. I mean, I'm going to put this here so for us to remember. Inarticulate shards. So. Oh my gosh, the inarticulate shards. Well, I think between the three of us, we probably have a collection of extraordinarily odd instruments that would make just wonderful cacophony. Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. I, I Yes. Okay, let's do it. Sign me up. Do it. Let's do it. Got stuff. I've got stuff. I've got, I'm excited. I can, I, play like, this I can play the brush. You've got the brush. I've got, I've got a marxophone and an omnicord. You're kidding. I just played a marxophone for the first time like a couple days ago. It's incredible. <gasps> the marxophone's my favorite. The way it resonates and it's all twangy. Ugh. Oh my uh, gosh. Well, now that Iwana is back in the city, because she, she just got back. I was texting her. I was like, you, you okay over there? Are you still in Greece? You still here? Because she was sending me dad jokes like one does. Her puns are uh, just oh, A+. Plus. She is a master punner. Yes. Um, <laughs> and like amidst amidst all the dad jokes, I was like, wait, are you back in LA yet? And she's like, yes, but very jet lagged. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I think once she's uh, kind of settled in and has recovered from... Grecian jet lag. Um, we'll have our first inarticulate shards rehearsal. Excellent. And um, it'd be amazing if Noah jumped on now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm ready. Let's do it. I mean, be I was like, how would we catch Noah up? It's like so meaning of life. Marxophones. The smell of freshly milled peanut butter. Oh, okay. I think that says it all. 
I think you <laughs> summed it up. You summed it up. I think we're gonna can we put that. Can we use that as a quote and a sticker on the album, please? Yes. Yes. I was like, we need to end the podcast now. Clearly, that's the only way that this can be. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time and for yapping away and and for, oh. for you. Well, for one, you 0% bored me, and for two, you're welcome, and for three, thank you. I appreciate that you took the time because hopping on Zoom with someone you haven't met before is weird, um, and you did it, <laughs> and I appreciate that. Well, you know, it's a two-way street. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is true. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Why Not Both. If you liked what you heard, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your preferred podcast platform. You can also come hang out with us on social media. We are at WNB the podcast, both on Instagram and on Twitter. This season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar magazine. Under the Radar is a nationally distributed print, music, and entertainment magazine and website. You can find them at www.undertheradarmag.com and feel free to support them on Patreon. Extra special thanks to our producer, Laura Studeris, who is literally a rock star. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you next episode. Thank you.